Welcome to Green and Red, Scrappy Politics for Scrappy People, a regular podcast on radical environmental and anti capitalist politics. Brought to you by Bob Bazanka and Scott Parkin. Welcome to the Silky Smooth Sounds of the Green and Red Podcast. I'm your co host, Scott Parkin, in Berkeley, California today. As always, I'm joined by uh, Bob Bazenko in Houston, Texas. And today we're going to be talking about Chile. It's the 50th anniversary of the coup where Pinochet and other forces overthrew the, the government of Salvador Allende. Uh, and we today we are joined by uh, Rodrigo Acuna, who works as an independent journalist on Latin America and for the uh, Department of Education in New South Wales. He's also host of Alvarada's Indestructible podcast and has been writing on Latin America, Latin American politics for close to 20 years. And then we're also joined by our old friend, uh, Clinton Fernandez, who's a professor of international political studies at the University of New South Wales in Canberra, Australia, uh, and whose work is primarily concerned with Australia's national security, in particular intelligence matters, Australian relations with the Southeast Asian neighbors, and has actually been pursuing to get documents related to the 1973 Chilean coup about Australians' intelligence services involvement there. So first, I want to welcome both of you to the Green and Red podcast. Thank you for having me. Yep. Thank, you Thank you for being here. We have, uh, we're very lucky to have two really of the more eminent uh, scholars uh, on this topic with us. Before we start specifically talking about Chile and the events of the early 70s, maybe for, for people listening who are aware of it, may not have a deeper understanding, we could start with, uh, let's say, the period around at the end of World War II, because Latin America uh, becomes very important in the uh, Cold War. John Kennedy, I believe, called it the, uh, the most dangerous area in the world uh, later, a, few, a, a decade or so after that. So do you want to just start to, to talk about the larger kind of U.S. role in the region and how that would eventually really become crucial and lead to the events of, of September uh, 11th, 1973. Either one of you can start with that. I... Okay. So I'll, I'll, just, I'll just set up as a layup. Basically, yes, it's the 50th anniversary of the overthrow of the Popular Unity government in Chile, but it's also the 200th anniversary of the Monroe Doctrine. And further afield, it's the 70th anniversary of the overthrow of Mossadegh in Iran. And these are basically part of a broader world again, a broader confrontation between Europe and its descendants versus the global South, the third world. And you, the broader aim has been for the economy, politics, and laws of the Western Hemisphere, North and South America, to be <clears throat> made available to the service of American corporations in the manner desired by them. And independent economic development was barred. You have, it has to be done in, in a way that subordinates certain societies and economies in the interests of the United States uh, and its corporations, uh, which are basically how, how the United States conceives its national interests. And 1945 was the Charter of the Americas, which barred independent economic development. And then there were obviously resistance to that. 1954, there was a coup in Paraguay. And 1958 is interesting. So Salvador Allende, he is, a, in a way, the, the, the Bernie Sanders of, of Chile because he contested the elections in 1952. And then next six years later, 1958. And in 58, he came this close to, to winning. And if he'd won just the two or, three, two or three percentage points, he could have won. And that would have been a democratic victory one year before the 1959 Cuban insurrection. Right? So th that, that historic sliding doors moment is not always appreciated. Then he tried again in 1964. And then finally, in 1970, he comes to power in as a, as the first of a in a three 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 cornered race. But uh, the major problem is that Chile's uh, economy was under American control. Its major export uh, earning uh, industry was copper, but the copper industry was really under the control of two American co companies, Kennecott and Anaconda, and its its telecommunications company was in, in under the control of IT. And the idea that Chileans could get control, greater control over their own resources was a problem. But for the, from the United States perspective, Kissinger and Nixon had an imperial understanding. They were, yes, they were interested in Kennecott and, and Anaconda and the interests of a guy called Augustine Edwards, who was like the both the Rupert Murdoch and the and a number of other barons in Chile. But really what they were interested in and concerned about is the idea that, the, that uh, this idea might spread 
it's the same thing as the Cuba threat. So th that's a broad uh, question. But the Chile-specific matters, I think, is something that should be addressed by Dr. Acuna, who is, in fact, probably Australia's leading Latin American scholar. So go ahead. I think I'd, I'd, I'd like to go back to just the, the period of the, of the 1950s, and I'd like to emphasize the organization of American states and how through the organization of American states and other organizations, the United States was basically able to lock in the or reinforce its uh, hegemony over many Latin American countries. That's particularly the case with the militaries in Latin America. A lot of the militaries in Latin America were trained at the School of the Americas and the supply of weapons. And there were exceptions or attempts to find alternative paths. But we're talking about the Cold War, so it's a polarized world. You're either with the Soviets or with, with the United States. The non-aligned movement comes, it, it takes place uh, later on in the story of the Cold War. But certainly by, by the 1950s and into the 60s, you had already had the Arbenz government in Guatemala, short-lived government. It was a progressive government, short-lived. It was violently overthrown. And I think another tendency that's important to the story in Chile is that of the social, the Christian Democrats who were on the one hand, there was, there were sectors within the Christian Democrats in Chile that were quite progressive. And there were others that were far more conservative. And they certainly in the election that, Chris, that Clinton mentioned, uh, they were funded by the United States and they obtained a victory there, but they also pushed several of the reforms. So they talked about a nationalization process where approximately 50% of the copper industry would be in, in the hands of the Chilean state. Allende, Popular Unity Coalition, talked about the full nationalization of Chilean copper. And that's what became a major problem for US interest in, in Latin America, is that you had a much more radical program, but you also had a program or a coalition that was democratic. The Allende, the Popular Unity Coalition, had an array of political parties on the, from the center left to the more hard left. And again, there was a, a figure that was respected by both the, the older generations of, of Chilean politics going back to the 1940s and the younger generation, which were, which believed or thought that the, the correct path was to carry out a Cuban style revolution. They thought the conservatives and the elite economic interests are too entrenched to accept any social democratic reforms. And the only way to carry out deep reforms in, in, in Latin America and in Chile was to uh, carry out a full scale revolution. And again, they was able to bring those forces together and, and carry forward the program of the popular unity government. Yeah. Uh, one, one question I have is that we, we see this, we see that we see this response from the, from the foreign policy establishment more abroad, like not just the U S but like other, other countries. And I'm curious in the 1950s, it's really a, a clear sort of bipolar sort of a world, but like once, once we get into the late sixties and into the early seventies, when we see Allende get elected and we see the overthrow, are there other forces at play here? I, I know that part of, part of the argument is that it's just you know, they didn't want to see a, a, I believe actually it was, they were worried about those Southern Cone nations having successful socialist programs. And I'm curious what forces were at play there. In, if I may answer, in, in, in Uruguay, you actually had a, a similar leftist coalition in the early 1970s, which came to power, which attempted to come to power. They, they didn't actually win an election, but they had a similar program to the Popular Unity government in Chile. And they also had the Tupamaros, which were a much more radical political urban guerrilla movement, a very successful urban guerrilla movement. So you had the local elites in Latin America and in particular in the Southern Cone being challenged by two, two fronts. One, a, a sort of a, one looking for a path through parliamentary democracy and another one looking for, to carry out a revolution. But both of them wanted deep structural changes and neither of them were going to be acceptable. If you go back to the 1950s with General Juan Perón in Argentina, he's a very complex figure. At the beginning of his government, he was far more progressive towards the end. He's, it's, it's a very Peronist politics in Argentina is really, is very complex. But from that period, again, Peron was not willing to cooperate with the United States on a lot of things, on a lot of fronts. And again, that, that proved to be problematic. And then when you get to the 1960s, there's a, a series of urban guerrilla movements or the emergence 
of urban guerrilla movements in Argentina, which were also attempting to overthrow the establishment. And they were lifting the, the banner of Che Guevara and, and revolution and also embracing the more radical side of Perón. And Perón is also trying to bring these two forces, these two factions together, but his government is short-lived and then it's followed by a, a dictatorship in, in Argentina. So I think if you're talking about the Southern Cone in Latin America, you're talking about these two trends, the, the, the a section of the youth which wants deep structural uh, transformations and they're not willing to play the parliamentary game and then an older generation which has experience like the chilean communist party the chilean socialist party and they've worked within parliamentary democracy in latin america and they have obtained some small changes and they would like to see that continue yeah i think that's important we talk about chile in isolation and it's a big deal but um the u.s is concerned about these kinds of political movements which involve labor unions and civil society long before Allende was elected. And you mentioned Guatemala and Venezuela, Guyana, Brazil around that same time, really, which includes John Kennedy, which is a dispute I've been having for years now with the JFK people about Kennedy's role and all this, but that's neither here nor there. But by Allende was elected and the U.S. obviously and, and Australia, we now know because of, of the work of both of you, really, the United States immediately was alarmed, right? It, what was Kissinger's famous line? We, we're not going to let a country become socialist due to the stupidity of its own voters or something go, like that. Go Didn't communist. He, yeah, go communist. Didn't he also say Chile is a dagger into the heart of Antarctica? I think. <laughs> ah, but but of course, that, the context for the Chile as a, as a dagger in the heart of Antarctica was when he was saying that it, it poses no threat to the United States. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the, the line I remember from Kissinger is the one he says to Gabriel Valdez, who was the foreign minister of Chile in 1969. And he says, nothing important can come from the South. I'm just going to read from my I know it's there. Nothing important can come from the South. History has never been produced in the South of the capital S. The axis of history starts in Moscow, goes to Bonn in West Germany, crosses over to Washington, and then goes to Tokyo. What happens in the South is of no importance, right? And uh, that's because the United States has long assumed that the resources of the South will simply be made available to the United States in the manner desired by it. And so Chile being a dagger at the heart of Antarctica was really a, a dismissal of, of any threat that Chile posed. But of course, once they realized that there was a, a, a new society was being envisaged, uh, greater plans, the, the resources being reoriented in order to develop Chile, then that would have a demonstration effect to other countries. And not just in Latin America, well, when uh, Kissinger and Nixon are talking, the, what they refer to is what's called the dimensions of the problem. Uh, that's the declassified cable. And they say, look, the, right now there's elections in Italy coming up. And if uh, Allende is successful here, it'll affect, it'll affect the prospects of social democracy uh, in Italy, uh, which might lead to greater neutrality and an independent force occurring in the center of Europe. And then he says, it would lead to us having to reconsider our own conception of what our role in the world must be. The, the United States' own conception of, what, it, what, the, of what, our, what the United States' role in the world must be. And that's the point at which Chile is no longer a dagger pointing at the heart of America. It's actually a, a mortal threat to the United States' role of it and its understanding of its own role. One question, maybe we could talk about this a little bit, is like what Allende did when, what Allende did when he assumed office, like we, nationalizing American companies and other private companies, labor rights, probably he was aligned with Cuba, probably other countries in the global South that the U.S. were threatened by, non-aligned countries. I'm wondering if we could just talk about that, if y'all could talk about that a little bit. And, and maybe that's a question for Rodrigo. I, I think it's important to note that even before Allende came to power, Allende had to actually meet with members of of congress and i'll have to look back at the records but i think the, the chilean military may have even been present in that meeting where he had to assure them that he were he to be were his election to be ratified by congress because again they had a small percentage that he had won in the for, for him to become president he had to be ratified by the chilean congress he had to guarantee the members at that meeting that he would not 
abolish parliamentary democracy. He would not engage in the full nationalization of the Chilean economy. And he said to them, yes, if, if you look at the Popular Unities program, there's nothing there that says we're going to engage in the full nationalization of the Chilean economy. We want to nationalize the copper. Yes, we think other strategic sectors of the economy should be nationalized, but we're committed to a multi-party parliamentary democracy, et cetera, et cetera. It wasn't until the assassination of, and Clinton's talked about this really well in the past, it's, it's, it wasn't until the assassination of General René Schneider, the head of the Chilean military, that then the momentum occurred for, and the pressure for uh, Congress to ratify Allende's victory because it was seen as something so shocking. It, Chile at that point ha, ha, did not have a history of political assassinations that that Allende's victory was ratified. Now, of course, once he came into office, the Popular Unity government went into overdrive into trying to carry out its its reforms. And they were noticed almost immediately. Within the first year, workers' wages uh, increased. There was a, a large program for nutrition in schools, program for children to have a glass of milk a day at school, housing programs, vast amounts of programs that were implemented through the Allende administration. And if we fast forward to the mid-1973, when the congressional elections took place, now the Chilean right and, and the Nixon administration is carrying out a, a almost a large economic war against the government and the effects are being felt. There's huge queues, people are, there's shortages everywhere. But even despite that economic war, the popular unity government managed to increase its vote in, and that goes to show that they, for all of their errors, they were successful. They, they had a lot of success in trying to follow through with their political program. They were going to try and transform Chile and make the, the country try and build a fairer society. Yeah, I, I think they, they famously said uh, they were going to make the Chilean economy scream, I believe that was it. What, When and what did the U.S. do to really ratchet this up? Um, and then how did Australia, and then you, after that, you can talk about how Australia gets involved in this too, because um, that's just an important piece to it that I think all of us have just learned about fairly recently because of your work. If you don't mind, I'll just like to jump oh, in. Sure. Before we get into that and what the United States did, Australia was involved from the start. You've got to understand that. Okay. So if you just go to the, I don't even mean 1973 and so on. If you go to the foreign relations of the United States and you look at, let me see, 1969 to 1976, volume 21. Okay, and I'm going to read something from the U.S. Embassy in Chile to the Department of State in January 1970. He says that the United States is as much of an idea as a community, and Chile is as much a clutch, a coffee shop of discussion as a country, because there's a lot of debates and discussions going on. And then they talk about how El Mercurio, which is the biggest newspaper in Chile, owned by the guy I mentioned earlier, uh, Gaston Edwards, who was like the Rupert Murdoch of the time, they actually published a two-column front-page story as the biggest news in 1969, the month before, inviting educated and professional Chileans to emigrate to Australia. Right? So it talked about how there was just uh, only a, less than a thousand Chileans in, in Australia at the moment. This is in 1969 and 1970. And so now there is a, an effort, he calls it the Australian Embassy's efforts to promote an exodus. And there was a, so you've got already the oligarchs of Chile that are, their power and their status inside Chilean society at the pinnacle of Chilean society and control of the economy relies on the United States empire protecting them and Chile's subordination. But also it requires the disempowerment of Chile by encouraging its educated, its technocratic class, people who can run an economy, run an advanced industrial society to get out of the country in order to make it harder and harder. So this is way before the 1973 coup. In 1970, Jan 1970, you've got the Australian embassy doing that. And now what we also know, uh, and I'll end with this and lead, lead Rodrigo in, is there were Australian security intelligence organization. So we have two, two types of agencies. One is the external age spy agency, which is a human intelligence agency called the Australian Secret Intelligence Service. And that's the overseas espionage agency. We also have the internal uh, security agency, security intelligence, called ASIO, the Australian Security Intelligence Organization. I believe uh, Mr. Parkin has some acquaintance with them. Very um, familiar. <laughs> <laughs> they are like the FBI in the United States, with the exception that they don't in investigate crime and they have no powers of arrest. Okay, So they are, the FBI has an intelligence wing, and then they also arrest and 
fight other things, whereas ASIO just goes after intelligence targets and politically motivated violence, but that has no powers of arrest. ASIO officers were masquerading as immigration officers in the Australian embassy in Santiago, Chile, and in a number of other embassies uh, around the world. And that was that fact was not told even to the immigration minister when he came in. The new immigration minister in 1972 found out after the election that he'd been elected that, my gosh, we've got intelligence agents masquerading as uh, immigration officers. And uh, uh, w what is the level of collaboration and cooperation and information sharing between those intelligence agents in the embassy and the Chilean secret police? Because if they are able to figure out the political sympathies of people who approach the Australian embassy, and they can then secretly pass that intelligence on to the Chilean secret police, it means that there are targets, can, uh, target lists can then be set up on who to arrest, who to kill, and so on, as soon as the, as soon as the green light is given to launch a coup. So that's what Australia's role was. And, you've got, and it's not, uh, people somehow think it's rather esoteric, but it's not. Australia sent troops to Vietnam even though Vietnam was not a military threat to Australia, for the same reason we sent uh, ACES and Asia officers uh, to Chile. In both cases, it's an attempt to prevent the global south more generally, living in dignity and getting control of its own resources. And that's the basic idea. So with that, I'll leave Dr. Acuna in to, to talk about the broader concerns. Clinton mentioned Augustine Edwards and his importance in Chilean politics, and he's completely correct. Augustine Edwards actually traveled to Washington at the beginning of the Allende administration to, to again, to put in this complaint about what was going to happen under the Allende administration and how the United States needed to work to try and undermine it and eventually over, overthrow it. Now, my understanding, and I get this from the work of Seymour Hirsch, that part of the reason why, and this Clinton can clarify, that I don't think this has been verified by internal Australian government documents, but what he speculated in his biography on Henry Kissinger was that the request was put through to the Australia to Australia because the Central Intelligence Agency was running into a few problems in Chile in terms of carrying out its operations to undermine Allende. Essentially, Allende's people were reliable and were causing, they were monitoring them and they were creating certain difficulties. The work had to be somehow subcontracted to, to Australia. Now, the communication between the two has not been declassified. And what Clinton managed to, to achieve in, in having this information declassified and what is available is just technical information like a certain typewriter was used, a certain lodgings were purchased. There was once mentioned there that, you know, Santiago in Chile, you need to have a fluent uh, understanding of Spanish because the majority of Chileans did not speak English. So it's very technical information which has been revealed. But there have been a lot of researchers and Australia, Australian journalists that have been trying to find the connection. What was ASIS, what was ASIO's role in, in Chilean affairs. And through this declassification, which took place on the 2nd of June, 2021, that's the, the, the station reports finally confirmed that yes, ASIS was involved in, had a presence in Chile in undermining the and the administration. Now, the consequences of that were absolutely catastrophic for the Chilean people. And we can talk about this uh, a little bit later on, but I think on a broader level, it's it makes sense that Canberra supported the United States. It has done so on so many fronts. It is part of a, a very close alliance. It's part of the Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance. So that's how political, economic, and military alliances work. Allies are meant to s support each other. And, and as Clinton mentions, and he goes into details in, in, in his book, that it is a sub-imperial relationship. So the ones who are calling the shots are definitely Washington and Australia, even to its own detriment, because the head of, I think it was a, the actually the head of ACES at the time, or the foreign affairs said, look, there's actually no strategic interest in for Australia in, in, in Chile, but they went ahead and sent uh, agents there anyway. Uh, I'll just say that there was a follow-up as well with, with Australia. So if you go once again to the same foreign relations of the United States, the 1969 to 76, uh, volume 21 that I uh, cited before, at 10 o'clock in the morning of 12th of September, so the morning after the coup was launched, they note that 
Salvador Allende has reportedly committed suicide. Um, and then Kissinger is, is there with uh, people from the State Department, Kenneth Rush, Jack, Jack Kubish, and the CIA, L. Colby. I believe he has descendants who are quite active on the Senate, at least. L. Rich Colby is quite active on turning China into Chile. But uh, there are other people as well, like Brent Scowcroft and Lawrence Eagleburger, people like that. What are they talking about? They're saying, yes, we need to, we should tell the new regime that we are well disposed towards it. But we don't want to be the first country to recognize you because it would not be in our interest. And then they say, we've got to make sure this new regime now succeeds. And in that same meeting, they talk about what we've got to do is, given that we've made the economy scream for the past three years, we've now got to go back to the Australians and the Argentinians and make sure that, that they get lots of wheat from there in order to help Pinochet out. So it's like a after sales service as well from an Australian foreign policy. You help as, a, as an imperial cutout, as a deniable agent. And then after the, immediately after, make sure that you have lots of wheat sales and multilateral assistance is then stepped up. I should also say, one of the first countries to recognize, probably the first country, although I'm not sure, but definitely one of the first countries to recognize the new regime that overthrew Allende, the new Pinochet regime, was China. The People's Republic of China was very pro Salvador, or very pro Augusto Pinochet. And people should not have any illusions in, take off the rose colored glasses, you should not have illusions in, in, in any country's foreign policy like that. They were one of the first countries, if not the first country, to recognize it because at the time they had their own theory as to how the world ought to work. And as far as they were concerned, supporting Pinochet was in their interest. It's always important to keep that in mind. It wasn't the United States that was the first to recognize it at all, it was China. Yeah. One, real, one real quick question I have just back while we're Back to the Five Eyes. Were there other Five Eye nations involved actually in this as well? Did we see British intelligence or Canadian intelligence playing a role here? Like mining, uh, uh, mining, Brit mining seems to be a big deal in Canada. So, for example, yeah, we do know that Britain was providing lots of assistance to the United States in Chile in the sixties, but the specific role in the in the events of September 11, 1973, no, we don't have any information about that. Right. Uh, basically, what was needed was some was a country that was not obviously going to do America's bidding, and that was Australia. Mm -hmm. I mean, Britain was known to be to have a presence. If you're in Chile or you're in, in South America, you know that Britain is already a Latin American power because they've got Belize. Mm -hmm. Belize at the time was not an independent state at all. And so there was Belize, and there was still the Falkland Islands or Malvinas. And so Australia, you wouldn't think about it. And so that's what makes Australia so important in this. It's like the country, right. it's the big people you don't expect hiding in plain sight. Yeah. To follow up on that before the coup, the US says we're going to make the economy scream. So we know that there's subversion. What are they doing in addition to that? Actually putting economic pressure, what kind of stuff are they doing to put economic pressure on Chile in addition to the subversion and reaching out to these dissident or you know, anti day elements in Chile? There's a very good book by a Chilean economist who actually worked for Salvador Allende called Edward Bolstein, Allende's Chile. And he goes into details about the war that the United States and its European allies carried out on Chile, essentially just, you know, through the cutting of credits or not renewing credits, immediately hurt the Chilean economy. So Allende found himself in a situation where he had to travel around the world to try and raise credits for projects that were already established and needed to continue to be funded. Now, with the Soviet Union, Clinton mentioned China, and he's absolutely right. With the Soviet Union, there was a situation that, on the one hand, because the Chilean Communist Party was a part of the popular unity government, the Soviet Union had to maintain good relations with Allende and had to publicly support it. But he was not, the, the Popular Unity Coalition was not really liked in Moscow in the sense that it was independent. There is a, there, there has been a, a, an independent, or, or there was during the Cold War, an independent uh, leftist uh, streak in, in Latin America, which recognized many aspects of the Soviet Union as being positive. But they were also really critical of the Soviet Union. And they said, we don't want to replicate the mistakes they have made and the model that they have. So they were totally pro-unions and pro-workers, et cetera, et cetera, but they weren't willing to tow Moscow's line. Salvador Allende did not call up Moscow and, and, and take advice from them. That was the Chilean Communist Party, as, as were all the Moscow-aligned communist parties throughout the world. So that was really interesting. I was just going to mention the point that Clinton had made before about the concerns of the Chilean military being recognized by the United States. 
as someone who's actually read some of those records through in, in, in other Latin American countries, that's something that continuously comes up in that when discussions about a coup d'etat have taken place in Latin American, throughout Latin America, the, what, the, one of the key concerns of the militaries, the local militaries, is will we be recognized by Washington? How long will it take for Washington to recognize us? And will economic aid, et cetera, et cetera, continue? Because they're well aware of the relationship and were the United States not to recognize them, they would immediately start running in, into problems. So that's a really interesting point. If you want to talk about US interventionism in Latin America, how are military coups planned and perceived by the guys on the ground, the military in the militaries throughout Latin America. And that's a key concern. How quickly will Washington recognize us or who's going to do it first? Is it going to be Brazil, but then it's going to be Washington, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's like a key component in the kind of internal security era, the Alliance for Progress, the creation of these military training schools in the U.S. that nurture that class of, of military officers who are going to go back and run these governments. It's, I don't want to take too much, but uh, it always strikes me. A couple of years ago, the book came out, The Jakarta Method, which I, I read honestly, but it's gotten very, but it strikes me that there's like a lot of different methods. It's not, it's even before Jakarta, we're seeing those kinds of things take shape and uh, could have been the, the Brazilian method or the Guatemala City method, the Caracas method or, or whatever. So. It, uh, interesting little note, the, before Allende was overthrown throughout the streets of Chile, in Santiago. The ultra right Patria Libertad, who who were the, the fascist goons, they sprayed everywhere. Mm -hmm. Carta viene, and it's Jakarta is coming. Jakarta mm -hmm. is coming. They knew mm -hmm. what had happened in Jakarta. Yeah, and that was yeah. So today, a bunch of these American right wingers are invoking Pinochet now. He's become a, gotten a second life now with these American crazies. So anyway, sorry about the, that interruption, but it's, it's... not not at all. I, I look. It's important to to see what they're talking about. So in in Jakarta's coming and so on. Jakarta's here. They're talking about the fact that the most important country in Southeast Asia, which is Indonesia, mm -hmm. in the population today, about 250, 280 million. And it's an archipelago that goes from the Indian Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. Thousands of islands, largest Muslim majority country in the world. And it straddles choke points for submarines and ships. It was the most important country in Southeast Asia. And when the, it had the largest Communist Party in Asia outside China. It was the third largest Communist Party in the world, three million members. It was a different kind of Communist Party, though. It was a not a revolutionary party, but rather a party committed to advancing the interests of the poor within the system. And that is from the standard reference work by Harold Crouch called The Army and Politics in Indonesia. And you'll find that around the page 320, 350, something like that. The not a revolutionary party, but a party committed to advancing the interests of the poor within the system. That made it a threat if you have an imperial understanding of the world. And that uh, army, when the Indonesian army destroyed the Communist Party with the help of uh, reactionary right-wing Islamic militias uh, connected to the landlords, whose own class position depended on the American system of power. That was, the, the effect of that was then discussed years later and even at the time, by American planners in Vietnam, people like George Bundy and others. And they felt that maybe we should stop fighting in Vietnam now, because the real point is to prevent the resources of Southeast Asia being used for the people of Southeast Asia rather than for a broader imperial purpose. So that's the first point, that, that in Indonesia, uh, it was seen as a defeat and rightly because it, it meant that, that the, the prospect of independent economic nationalism was finished once the Indonesian Communist Party was defeated. But Chile under Pinochet was not at all a success. So when the American right start talking about Pinochet and the American miracle, let's just keep a few things in mind. Yes, Pinochet comes to power in September 1973, and they bring in the neoliberal economists, the so-called Chicago boys. And they had perfect experimental conditions to run the economy they, the way they wanted. There was no resistance from unions because these people were being killed and disappeared and abducted and tortured. They had no resistance from international financial institutions because the United States was backing them. Mm -hmm. In five years' time, they crashed the economy. They, the neoliberalism first failed, not in the global financial crisis of 2008 or even in 2022. Neoliberalism was born in Chile, but it failed in Chile. Its model was proven. 
to have been a failure in Chile itself. And guess what? We only, they tanked the economy, crashed it in five years. That's all it took. And, and it crashed in 1982. The only source, meaningful source of revenue coming in was the nationalized copper company, Codelco, right? And so economists used to joke that you guys have delivered the, the Chicago road to socialism. You haven't actually delivered anything like that. Uh, uh, and so neoliberalism, neoliberalism when, 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 when the American right starts talking about how we need a Pinochet style thing in the United States, even on its own terms, it's failed in Chile. Pinochet failed on his own terms of, of claiming to deliver a better society and so on and a better economy. And Americans should be, should be, should be aware of this, that yes, if you get a Pinochet, it doesn't mean, it means you're actually going to wind up, you're possibly going to wind up even worse off than you are now. In, in thinking about Jakarta and the brutal the brutal repression that happened after that, I I, I often think back about I think about Op Operation Condor and this alliance of intelligence agencies to target leftist Latin American leftists, including there was a car bomb in in Washington D.C. at the Institute for Policy Studies. I'm wondering if you could actually talk a little bit about about Operation Condor. And there's all this repression is going on in these countries where these coups happen, but it, it seems like that was like a, a, a very important part, especially internationally. I'd love to hear that from from Dr. Acuna. Go ahead, Rodrigo. Operation Condor is a conglomeration of the heads of the Latin American militaries in the Southern Cone, Brazil included, and they decide to coordinate their efforts, essentially coordinate their efforts. So if a person of interest is arrested in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, and it happens to be a Brazilian trade unionist who was on the run from the military, they can quickly communicate to Sao Paulo, Brasilia, wherever they need to communicate, where they're tracing the background of this person of interest. And, and get a profile on them in, in, in real time. Of course, this is not, this is uh, quite new, given that today we have the internet where telecommunications are far more advanced. But in, in the 70s, this process was new and it was effective. People were arrested in, in, in various, throughout various parts of, of Latin America. And, and they were quickly, brutally interrogated and then either executed the country in the country where they were originally arrested or they were transported back to Uruguay or Argentina or Chile, and then underwent further interrogation. Now, prior to the operation being implemented, yes, there again, as I, I mentioned before, there were urban guerrilla movements. There were people that supported that 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 stream of thought that the Latin American elites needed to be challenged and they needed to be challenged radically. Of course, Che Guevara's efforts in Bolivia, his capture and his execution in 1967 promoted that that vision. A lot of people in, in, in Latin America thought if, if the great Che Guevara was willing to die in Bolivia, then why can't we engage in similar efforts? And you have to remember that by the time, in, in 1967, Bolivia already had a military dictatorship. So there were dictatorship. People throughout the region were aware of, of their history. So it was, these arguments could not simply be easily dismissed. Oh, you're romantic, et cetera, et cetera. You look at the history of, of Central America and the guerrilla movements that arose there. Again, it, it, they became prominent precisely because democratic reforms were simply impossible. You had uh, generation after generation of peace activists that had tried to question the, the rule of the Somosas in Nicaragua, for example, and they were just wiped out. And how many times can that occur? One generation, two generations, by the second or third generation, the younger generation are not going to accept those arguments. They're going to say, no, sorry, we've tried the peaceful method to remove the, these US-backed goons. What we need to do now is we need to organize, get some machine guns and head to the mountains. So there was a, a guerrilla presence in, in Latin America, but the Latin American militaries, they exaggerated the numbers. They were able then to obtain further funding from the United States. This was really evident during Plan Colombia in, in Colombia. They had the, the countless peasants that were executed and that have machine guns planted next to them. And they would say, they would call them falsos positivos, false positives. So there is a, there, there, there was a history of that taking place in Latin America and countless people were arrested and falsely accused of being uh, part of underground uh, networks. But the idea was to maintain a, a coordination, maintain fear, and certainly go after people that were putting a lot of time and effort into trying to create movements that were going to eventually overthrow or try and overthrow the, the military dictatorships in Latin America.
to, to follow up on that, because you, you brought something to mind. Did I end up have any kind of, I don't know if I want to call it extra legal or armed forces that would support him? I'm thinking of one of the problems Kareem Kasim had in, in Iraq was that he disarmed his own supporters because he thought that might pacify the U.S., but in fact, it, it actually occurs to me more. Is so there anything like that happening in, in Chile? Yep. Yeah, the Izquierda Revolucionaria, uh, Movimiento Izquierda Revolucionaria, the MIR. So the MIR were a group of originally university students from Concepcion, and they were totally pro-Cuban. So they believed that the path forward was to create an urban guerrilla movement and eventually overthrow the Chilean establishment. They traveled to Cuba, they received training in Cuba. And many of them were actually linked to the Chilean Socialist Party. So they had uncles and aunties in the Chilean Socialist Party. And, and they would have fierce discussions between them. Some would say, some family members, the older generations would say, look, we need to, you need to support Allende. Allende has proven himself time and time again to be, yes, a parliamentary politician, but he's a radical. He's committed to trying to change and better Chilean society. And the younger generation were a little bit were critical, were skeptical. So what ended up happening is that Allende said, look, I've got a genuine security concern. Why don't you guys, since you guys like to run around playing revolutionary, why don't you guys get the training and create a, what's called the Grupo Personal, the Guardia Personal, or Grupo, Grupo, sorry, Grupo de Amigos Personales. So it was basically his personal security team. And that was all members of the MIR that roughly about 40, 50, 60 of them. And they were the ones that fought with President in the presidential palace for several hours. They were the ones that held off the Chilean mil military to the point where they had to call in the Air Force to bomb La Moneda. And when the presidential palace is burning, Allende gives the orders to them to leave the presidential palace because they're all going to die burnt to death. And then when they surrendered, that's when Allende walks off and, and commits suicide. Now, the majority of the GAP, as they were known, they were executed. The majority, the overwhelming majority were hideously tortured, brutally tortured, and, and, and were executed. So it's a, it's a tragic story, what happened to the GAP. There was another thing, though, which is that the, Mr. Allende did not, Dr. Allende did not, in fact, take the full Fidel Castro advice of arming the workers. And that's what happened in Indonesia, I should add that there was a disarmament of the Indonesian left after 1948, which then meant that they could no longer defend themselves come 1965. And that, that is something that I never took on board from, from Cuba. The actual the, the FARC in Colombia, in the, the FARC in Colombia did the same thing. They laid down their arms and then they got slaughtered. Yeah. Rodrigo, you, could you talk a little bit about some of those people in the, the personal security team? and the connection with Australia, because I know that there are, at one point, the largest Latin American community in Australia were in fact Chileans. And I know that you have personal connections and, or, and knowledge of some of those people, family members and so on, who, not your own family, but the broader Chilean Australian community family, mm -hmm. who are some of the survivors and, and people who are related to people who disappeared. Have you got any examples Certainly. of that? Yes, certainly. Look, the, the, because my parents left, were, were forced to flee Chile in the mid 1970s, they were part of the first wave of political refugees that arrived in, in Australia that, that were precisely that political refugees. I grew up in that community here in Australia. I know many of people from that generation that were directly arrested, tortured, had family members that were executed. And in the case of the GAP, there is a, a lady who's a close family friend and, and two of her brothers were actually uh, members of the presidential, the president's personal bodyguard team. And one of them was disappeared. I think it was the first day or the second day after the coup. And the second one was arrested and he was tortured in, in such a brutal fashion that he is disabled and he has difficulty speaking. And he's lived in Australia for several decades and his sister is a carer for him. And she travels every four, five, six, seven years when information is presented to her that the remains of her brother may have been found. She travels back to Chile and it's absolutely heartbreaking. This is someone who is now in her seventies. She's my mother's generation. And, and she's just one person that I know. There are many other Chileans who to this day will return to Chile and, and every time there is a, a common grave uncovered, they will travel there in, in the hope of finding their loved ones and being able to bury them. In South Africa, there was a Truth and Reconciliation Commission and even in East Timor, there was a, 
Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but only inside Timor. The perpetrators had fled to Indonesia. Was there anything like that in, in Chile? Because uh, a lot of the perpetrators are still living in, it seems to me, in the open. So what's been the, the truth-telling or anything like that? What institutions have occurred in Chile since, what's occurred in Chile? So it's it, here, I think it's a good thing to talk about both Chile and Argentina because the processes are, are quite similar, but they're also quite different. So under both of the, dicta once, once the dictatorships stepped down in Argentina in the early 1980s, in Chile in 1990, the case of, in Argentina, the military, the judicial process against the military began quite quickly. There, there was a larger rejection because of the Falklands and, and the Malvinas and how the Argentine military had lost. Uh, the, the, the sentiment amongst much of the population was you claim you came to power because you needed to put order into the country and you're the military, but you can't even win wars. So there was a large rejection by the uh, Argentine population. And eventually, Videla, the head of the junta in Argentina, he died in prison. He died in prison. You can check the date. I think it was 2012, around about those years. In Chile, there was a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that took place a few years after the, shortly after the dictatorship. But General Pinochet made himself a senator for life and head of the Chilean armed forces until 1998. So the only people that were in, were put on trial and incarcerated in the mid-1990s were people like Manuel Contreras, the head of the DINA, the head of Chilean intelligence. Really the people that had a lot of blood on their hands and, and there were a lot of people that could connect them to the disappearances of other Chileans. But because the way the military managed to, to tie tie things up after they stepped down. That, that was the exception. That was not you know, the majority of people that conducted vast human rights violations were not put on trial. So now that, that process has commenced again in, in the last few years because of public pressure. And so only a week and a half ago, one of the murderers of Victor Jara, for example, was sent, sentenced to 15 years prison. And instead of beginning to commence his, his, his sentence, he committed suicide. So that's the difference between Chile and, Argen, and Argentina. And I can just say that very briefly, that in Argentina, there's actually a, a day where people, it's called scratche. And what they do, the victims of the dictatorship, they will... If they know there's someone who participated in the military regime and, and, and they conducted torture, they will go and spray graffiti outside of their home. They'll let their, their boss know that they're employing a former torturer. They try and, and make their life a, a bit of a miserable. And, and that's something that occurs on that. They, they might, there's a wider rejection amongst Argentine society, I think, in, in contrast to Chilean society. Believe it or not, Pinochet did also have his supporters. Hey folks, you're listening to the Green and Red podcast. We're having a great conversation about the Chilean coup of 1973, where it's the 50th anniversary of Chile's 9-11, as it's been referred to. We're talking with Dr. Rodrigo Acuna and uh, Dr. Clinton Fernandez. Uh, and maybe one, one question that we actually haven't gotten into too much is around the events of September 1973 in, in Chile. And, I, and I'm wondering if you could just actually talk a little bit about some of what went in motion. And then there's the, I actually often think of, there's a Clash song called Washington Bullets, which actually talks about the soccer stadium in Santiago. And I'm wondering if you could also talk about some of the repression and the impacts of what happened after happens after the coup. There was an attempt in, I think it was June or July, to carry out a, a short-lived coup and it was more of a testing ground to see who was actually going to be loyal to the Allende administration and who was going to try and overthrow it. Pinochet himself didn't actually reveal his hand until the very end. I wrote a, a, a detailed article into Lucia who was his wife and was crucial to his career, his military career in terms of being promoted and sucking up to the right people and networking and all this sort of stuff. And he was presented to Allende and Allende perceived him as being someone who was going to be loyal to the constitution, who was a political 
And, and that's why he was given the position that he was given. And he did not reveal his hand until the very end. He was an, a, a, a complete opportunist because once he was successful in carrying out the coup d'etat he then turned on the other members of the junta and he usurped power almost completely for himself so he made himself the head of the junta and he made manuel contreras the head of the dina of the chilean intelligence now in terms of the actual the day of the coup as Clinton said, Allende did not arm the workers, and that was a, a debate that, that was taking place within Chile. You have to know a little bit about the history of Chile there. And in the late 1800s, there was actually a civil war in Chile. There was a president called Manuel Balbaceda. And again, a, a battle over control of resources and foreign interest. And that administration, as I said, resulted in a civil war and an attempted coup and a civil war. And approximately 10,000 Chileans died in that civil war. So Allende used to make a lot of speeches during that time saying, I don't want to see Chile descend into a civil war. I think to be critical of Allende, I think the, the, the other thing about Allende was that he was a really skilled negotiator. So his nickname was La Muñeca de Oro, which means the gentleman with the golden wrist. The Chilean political right and members of Congress and the business community they used to actually hate having to go into negotiations with Allende because they would go in with, say, a, a 20, 20 points, a 20 point plan. They, they would, and, and they would come out losing the majority of them. Allende would persuade them to concede on so many points. So they actually used to hate negotiating with him. And I think this made him overconfident. And he thought that possibly he was going to be able to negotiate his way out of the crisis. He also he also wanted to present to Congress a referendum on his administration. So whether he should stay or he should go, whether there should be a new constitution or not. And that was apparently going to be put forward to Congress on, on the day or the day after the coup. And the, on the day of the coup, as I said before, the people that stayed and fought with Allende were his personal guard. He actually said to the the members of the Chilean police, the Carabineros de Chile, I think they had something like 50 police officers stationed at the presidential palace to guard the presidential palace. Their job was to guard the president. And he said to them, gentlemen, there is a coup taking place. I'm going to remain at the presidential palace. I'm not going to resign. If you want to fulfill your constitutional duties, you will stay. And if you don't want to, you can leave. And all of them left. So Allende was completely abandoned. The only people that fought with him to defend him were his personal guard. And then when the tanks and the, the, the fighter jets were, on the, were in the sky, the military were on the streets, the, there was some resistance from the Mir and other parts throughout Santiago, but it was minimal. That's, that's, and so people were basically slaughtered, taken to the national stadium, brutally murdered. And going back to the case of Australia, it, it's our understanding that there was one agent that remained in, in Chile after, the, after September 11, 1973, and as I've written about, and most experts and, and, and Chileans would know, you would have to be, be deaf, dumb, and blind not to have seen the repression in Santiago. Bodies floating down the Mapocho River, the main river of, of, of Santiago. The military were everywhere, and, and people were being rounded up. And uh, any excuse for them to arrest you, beat you, torture you, or execute you that was needed, they would implement, and vast numbers of people were executed. And, and, we're, and, we're and I'll just point out one more time, I'm sorry, God, but Rodrigo, I just want to point that yes, the ACES station, the external uh, spy agency station was shut down, although an agent stayed behind, but the ASIO officers, the counterintelligence Correct. officers remained in the embassy. Yes, and yes. so the extent of their collaboration with the Chilean secret police for years after is what it, it, it has to be understood as well. So yes, yes. Uh, it's not just a a ACES. And, and that is going to come up again. And we have to keep reminding people that ACES is not the only intelligence agency that was in Chile. Sorry, Scott, go ahead. Oh, my, my question was the people who were being rounded up, were those were like trade unionists and leftists and students who had been involved in like social movement, left social movements and things like that. That's who ended up in the stadium or were they also or their families, or what have you. I'm just trying to get a sense of... The, those were the people that were immediately targeted. Anyone mm. that worked with the... was a part of the popular unity government, they were immediately targeted. So any member of the government, if they could be arrested and shot, they were arrested and shot, or if they could be arrested, tortured, that took place. And then you started going down. You go after the ministers, you go after their advisors, you go after the people that worked in their offices, and, and then you went after the, the base, you went after the local university students that were the leadership of the university students of the Communist mm -hmm. Party, the Chilean Socialist Party, the MAPU, the MIR, 
and the list went on and on. And then when you wiped all of those people or you arrested all of those people and you were beating those people up and torturing those people, then you went after the auntie that may have participated in a cooperative and might have put up a poster of a yen there on a local neighborhood, wherever. That's that's how it, it, it continued. And then once all of those people were a significant part were, were arrested, tortured, beaten, killed, went underground, then you started making things up. Then that was also quite common in, in, in Chile, in Argentina, many of the Latin American dictatorships. You would plant evidence because that would mean a, a promotion. So if you found a five-year-old university student who had long hair and had Dostoevsky in his bag, then that's it. You just place the revolver in his bag you would, and you would go after him as well. The, it, it, it was, the repression was absolutely ferocious, brutal, and, and inhumane. Clinton, we talked to you like last year about the new documents you've been getting declassified or trying to get declassified. Yes. So do you want to just briefly again reprise a little of that, talk about what Australia yes. was doing at that particular moment and what you how you got involved in this and what you're uh, sure. My my interest, uh, I've never been to Chile, so I'm not a Chilean expert. And I'm an Australian who's who specializes in Australian foreign relations. So I knew that we'd done sorry, I just had a beep. Uh, I knew that the same ambassador that we had in our embassy in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, his next posting was to Santiago, Chile. And in, and in 19, uh, 1969, 1970, that ambassador, his name is Noel Deschamps, D-E-S-C-H-A-M-P-S, -S, Noel Deschamps, there had been uh, a disclosure by a, a previous intelligence officer inadvertently, and they were thinking about prosecuting him for it, he didn't mean it, about how ACES had been involved in fomenting a parliamentary coup against Prince Siamuk of Cambodia, right, which actually happened in, in 1970. And at the time, the same dynamic was in place because the United States did not have an embassy in Cambodia. And so the United States' interests were being handled by the Australian embassy in Cambodia. And so when the rumored ACES involvement in the deposition, the coup against Prince Siamuk in Cambodia occurred, the very next position for this posting for the same ambassador was in Santiago, Chile. And so I began by requesting access to ACES records on both Cambodia and Chile. I wasn't actually focusing on Chile. I was focusing on Australian foreign relations, which meant you have to see it as part of a broader sub-imperial posture, which mirrors the military position and so on. Our wars are sometimes called other people's wars when we send troops to fight in Malaya and Vietnam. But if you're a sub-imperial power, then you're then there's no such thing as other people's wars because you're, the aim of your foreign and defense policy is, the uphold, is to uphold the imperial system. And so defense and security and strategy have to be understood in an imperial sense, not in a direct threat to the Australian mainland sense. So I began by asking for that. And the head of ACES then replied by saying that to even confirm or deny the existence of records on Cambodia and Chile today, that's in, 19, in 2017, when I first put the request in, would harm Australia's national security today. So we said, well, no worries. We're going to take you to the tribunal and you'll be cross-examined under oath. Now, you've got to understand, the Australian Secret Intelligence Service was established in 1952. At no time had the Director General of that service ever had to answer questions from anyone in the public or even members, even from Parliament in, in, in the open. And so starting in, say, 1952 until 2017. So what is that? Uh, 67, 65. 65 years? Yeah. Uh, that, and, and they, they'd gone without any kind of scrutiny. So for the first time, the Director General of, of, of ACES found himself being cross-examined for the first time by, by us. And he didn't like the experience, you know, and uh, he was unused to it. So initially, so when they realized that was going to happen, they dropped the neither confirm nor deny position just days before the, the, the proceedings. And they said, okay, we do have records on Cambodia and Chile, but to show you what the records are would cause harm to national security today. So that's when we began to cross-examine the guy again. We cross-examined the head of ACES twice in 2017 and 2018, I believe. And uh, sorry, in 2019 as well. And at one point, it was quite uncomfortable for him, unfamiliar in any case. And he said, look, in Russia, Putin's spy chief doesn't have to face these sorts of questions. I don't know why I've got to do it. And it, it's, uh, they, they don't have this sort of disadvantage. Of course, that's he's entitled to his view. But as far as I was concerned, if you'd like to live in Putin's spy chief world, then go and live there. But you live in Australia, as do we. And uh, you have to answer questions under Australian law. And after 
two sessions and the prospect of a third cross-examination, they pulled out another card. They said, all right, we, we now have other people inside ACES who are going to give evidence about why to reveal this sort of information is so secret. Now, under Australian law, the chief of ACES is the only person who can be identified by name as the chief of ACES. Right? No other ACES officer can be identified by name. If you know the name of an ACES officer, if you know the name of an ACES officer, and you disclose that name, then uh, it's a violation of our Crimes Act. You're not supposed to talk about uh, the identities of agents. So in order to get out of the, of the head of ACES being forced to be cross-examined, they said, we've got other ACES people now who are going to give evidence. Uh, but because you can't cross-examine them, you can't tell their identities, they're going to do it from behind the screen. So you'll only hear their voice, right? Um, and they've got these certificates, which are signed off by the attorney general, that say, this: you don't have to give your answer to the person asking it. We'll get the, we'll get the question of Amy Fernandez and, and lawyers out of the room, and you can make your case as to why it should be secret in private. Imagine that. So we get in for about half a day to a day and a half, maybe. And then they get in for about three days, and they can. it's all in private for them. They can hear our case. We can't hear their case. And then we are invited back in and asked, do you want to make any submissions to what was just said? Uh, even though you're out of the room for three days, so you don't know what, don't know what was just said. Um, but in the course of day one, which is the 2nd of June, 2021, it was a long day. And uh, they were, we did cross-examine the agents they put up behind the screen. And it, it became unsustainable, I believe. Their, their position became unsustainable. And so at the end of day one, they handed over about 500 documents in a lever arch folder, the, the binders. Many of them were blacked out, but they gave us a lot. And then we had to go back in court the next morning, starting at 10 o'clock. So when we got the papers at about 7 p.m., I basically did an all-night analysis just to stay through and work through all of that. And then back in court at, at 10, my lawyer was, of course, asleep. He needed to be alert the next morning. But we realized what we'd gotten. We'd gotten a threshold had been crossed. In other words, officially, the government, through the intelligence agencies, admitted that they set up a, an ACE station in Santiago, Chile, that they conducted uh, certain types of operations, the details were not disclosed, about as a liaison, they conducted spy operations as a liaison, a go between the CIA and the uh, Chilean military. And then they talk about operational problems, the, the safe houses, the a car, a safe, they rented a safe and they, they bought a safe. We know the combination number of that safe. There's all kinds of discussions about it. The head of ACES, interestingly, said, if and this is the new prime minister, if you want, we can pull our people out and I can sort things out with the Americans. I can make things right for them. You don't have to worry about it. But the prime minister said, no, we, I want to make sure the United States doesn't take, take offense at us and doesn't uh, have a problem with this. So let, let the agents stay. So we basically know that. And you've got to put the whole thing together. You've got ASIO officers in the embassy uh, five years before that, maybe long, much before it. You've got ACES coming in. You've got wheat being denied and then resold in order to protect the and ensure the success of the Pinochet government. So Australia is involved in all, at all stages, in to the extent that it can participate. It's a smaller place. But the damage done uh, was not insignificant. Uh, Chile's population uh, back in 73 was about 10 million. You know, that's a tenth of Brazil's population, 200 million. And today, Chile's population is about 20 million. And uh, Brazil's population is 200 million. So it's still a tenth of that. But in that small population of 10 million, there were 100,000 credible cases of torture, right? And what we need to figure out now is for the government to make a disclosure about to what extent were our intelligence agencies involved in collecting intelligence and giving names to the Chilean secret police in order to go, go after certain people. So the precedent is actually Indonesia, Jakarta, which we talked about just a few minutes ago in the show. The Indonesian military actually did not have the names of who to kill and who to arrest. The United States Embassy had been compiling that from open sources, right? In other words, the United States Embassy, the Australian Embassy, had been compiling names of key activists from the published newspapers of the Socialist and Communist Party papers. Then they published and said, this meeting is being held. There are people in the embassy who actually wrote, write this all down, and there is a there are biography units among the intelligence the, the intelligence agencies of the, of the five highest countries, which maintain lists of who are the people. And without that, the Indonesian military had no idea actually how to take out the Indonesian Communist Party. And we believe that, not me and, and Rodrigo, me, we and my lawyers, we believe that exactly the same thing occurred in Chile. Because that's the default assumption. The default assumption is that the targeting, the, the detailed scrutiny, 
uh, is something that that goes back to the British Empire, and it goes back uh, to to Britain maintaining lists of people in independence movements in in its own colonies, and then that was then replicated to a, in a different way with new technology, namely wireless and telegraph, in the American occupation of the Philippines. And the, the, the surveillance state that we talk about today with massive surveillance, it actually, its origins date back to the American occupation of the Philippines with the leading technology back then. So we believe that the targeting lists of who to arrest, who, to, who is to be betrayed, who is to be locked up, what is their connection, the network analysis of the Chilean left may well have been done by the foreign embassies and given to the Ch Chilean secret police to give. So that's the next step. And that's not my role. That's for the Chilean community in Australia to to take action, which we can assist with, but basically it's for them to, they have the will, and it's not all on Dr. Acuna's head. Uh, they can then systematically set up a, a secretariat to, to manage the process of declassification. We, we really appreciate this. I know we're getting, we've been talking for quite some time. We just, I think I have a couple more questions and then we will, you, you've been so gracious and I talked to you about this. We could talk to you about this for hours, but at any rate, what, so 1973, Pinochet comes to power. What was the kind of global response to the coup and, and the aftermath of it? We have the repression in Chile, but was there any criticism of, of the U.S. role in, in 1973? Did most countries just immediately recognize Chet and begin trade and investment? Uh, you know, what, what followed in that post-coup period? Uh, it's different in, in different parts of the world. Um, among the non-aligned movement, there were called, there'd been calls for a new international economic order. You know, and and they, they've easily, they clearly understood that had there been no coup in Chile, then they wouldn't have been, uh, probably wouldn't have been a coup in Peru or, or uh, uh, Argentina. And who knows, maybe even the, uh, uh, the Paraguayan and Brazilian and Boliv uh, Bolivian um, uh, militaries might have had their psychological resolve weakened. Uh, the People's Republic of China immediately recognized Pinochet and uh, uh, played a very negative role, I have to say. Um, uh, but... Uh, it, it, elsewhere in Latin America, I think we've covered that, but maybe Rodrigo can go for that. That's just the, the, the ripple effects. That's right. It was, you'd have to be looking at the region by region and their regional, their alliances. So of course, with the exception of China, because it had hostilities with, with the Cesar and its view of the world, but the Soviet bloc, or they were all uh, incredibly harsh on condemning the Pinochet dictatorship. The Soviet Union, in fact, refused to play at the stadium in Chile, a World Cup qualifier. So FIFA was flown in, FIFA officials were flown into the stadium and Pinochet showed them that all the political prisoners were, they were taken elsewhere and the FIFA officials were shown around the stadium and they concluded that there was no torture taking place at the stadium and that the conditions were optimal for a World Cup qualifier to take place. So the, but the Russians still did not turn up. So the, the Chilean team scored the goal, the one goal needed, and they were off to the World Cup. You, you have to look at, again, as I said, the, the different countries and the different sectors within each country. So a lot of the trade unions in the UK, in Australia, were critical, refused to cooperate on any front with the dictatorship and were crucial in helping many Chileans leave the country and seek a safe passage. The church, the Catholic church was also crucial in helping Chileans leave the country. I'm just continuing on. This process continued in Latin America all the way into the 1990s, these uh, military regimes. And I, it was quite amusing to me as a total outsider to Latin America uh, to see how at precisely the point at which the Clinton administration turned into the Bush administration, Bush the, II. The Bill uh, Clinton administration, not the Clinton Fernandez administration. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I just had to make a joke. My administration did very well for you. But uh, no, but the, the Bush administration, Bush the son, what was the criticism of him from the United States liberal managers of empire that he was not even been neglecting Latin America, right? It's precisely at that point that Latin America's pink tide came back and uh, they began to have some internal cohesion. And it's very revealing to me, one of the most interesting things that, happened, or that, that, that was not said generally, is the entire 15, 20 years of the war on terror, there was not a single black site anywhere in Latin America. All the war on terror, the, the, the rendition program, the torture program, the black sites, they were all in Eastern Europe and in, uh, in, in the traditional client states in the Middle East. Very there was not a yeah. single, yeah, there was not a single thing. So when the criticism is that you're neglecting 
Latin America, well, that's a good thing, right? Because uh, it means that they finally, if you neglect them, they have a chance to, to reorient themselves and come to their own internal arrangements. And that's exactly what's happening. We are actually seeing, right in, in the contemporary period, the reassertion, not of a global South solidarity, but the, the reassertion through multilateral organizations of individual countries pursuing their national interests as they define them. India's strategic autonomy is one side and the other side of the world. But in Latin America, you've got in Colombia, you've got Argentina, Brazil, Chile, and other countries, all of them are responding to domestic forces in their country, both popular and elite domestic forces in their country, like in Brazil, for example, agribusiness. But they are breaking free of the unipolar American world, but not at this stage anyway, in a South sense of solidarity, which was the case in 1973-74, when there was a South call for the new international economic order. Now we are seeing the return of the global South, but not as the global South, but rather as an attempt to carve out some independent policy space through the assertion of what they call the national interest. And whether that will ever transform into a South, a wider South cooperation, we don't know yet. I think Scott has a final question. Olga, I'm just going to basically say thank you and uh, tell people if you're listening to this, not to turn it off at the end, we're going to put in a clip that uh, Clinton sent us actually of uh, Noam Chomsky reading uh, Salvador Allende's last letter, I believe it was. So, so stay tuned at the very end. But I want to thank you. I, there's a lot more on my mind, but we, we, we we're thankful for you both. And especially, I've, like I said to Rodrigo before we went on, I've, I'm familiar with your work, but I never knew you were in Australia. You knew this particular character here. So that's a, quite a dynamic duo. I think it's really cool and we really appreciate it. I'm sure we'll be hitting you both up in the future. So Clinton is maybe our most frequent guest. I don't know. He be, so probably is. So. Yeah. We should give you a, a an award for that or some kind of prize or something like that. Don't worry. Don't worry. Yeah. Uh, Scott, go ahead. My fact, I also want to express great appreciation for y'all coming on and, and thank you for coming on. My last question is around actually Chile today around the coup. Um, the, the president, Gabriel Boric, comes out of social movements like the 2019 uprisings that were happening in, in Chile. But then he also tried to pass a, uh, a new constitution, which he got blocked on. And then I also, in preparing for the interview, I, I read a about a poll that came out earlier this year from a firm called Lagos that found that 36% of Chile, Chileans believe that the military freed Chile from Marxism when it deposed Allende and found that 42% said the coup destroyed democracy, is the opposite side, uh, but it's the lowest number since 1995. And I'm just curious, particularly from you, Rodrigo, what is happening in, in, in Chile today and what is this an important sort of development that's going on? Like this poll, the blocking of the new constitution, that sort of thing. And then it's also interesting that Boric also has opened up an investigation into the, the remaining 1,000, 1,100 people who have been who are disappeared and still unaccounted for. Hmm. The polls, according to the political climate of the country. So if you go back to 2019, where massive demonstrations took place against the increment of the metro fairs on Santiago's metro system, which then it, it was initiated by the high school students movement and then supported by the university students. And then it became a full scale, almost a social uprising against free market and neoliberal e economics. If you go back to that period and you took a poll or if there were polls taken about the Pinochet era, I'm sure the view that Pinochet destroyed uh, Chilean democracy and carried out massive human rights violations and they, they would be quite high. But since then, unfortunately, the political right has been capable of manipulating, I would say, public opinion in terms of where their interests lie. So that uprising resulted in referendum taking place to replace the Pinochet constitution. And despite the referendum winning that a new constitution had to be written once that 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 committee that parliamentary committee was set up that was not supported it was not ratified so they've now had to put together another parliamentary committee and and it's essentially been because the political right have been able to make a a comeback one of their key arguments has been that I guess more intelligent ones will concede that yes, there were human rights violations under Pinochet. Yes, the general, uh, there were excesses under, under the general, but at least he put the economy in order. At least he put the house in order. And they always point to Cuba. They always say, look at Cuba now. 
What they don't mention, is, as Clinton accurately uh, noted, what were the conditions for average Chileans during the Pinochet uh, regime? For average Chileans, the conditions were horrific. There was a uh, large-scale unemployment, rampant inflation. The ones to fail at the neoliberal experiment were the Chicago boys, were Pinochet himself, and they had all the optimal conditions to be able to carry out that experiment. They had zero resistance from the unions because they crushed them. They had zero resistance from the political left because they destroyed them and on. So that argument, I don't think, holds any real weight. But because of the power that the political right has in Chile, and, and institutions like El Mercurio. El Mercurio is still around, the newspaper El Mercurio. It's still considered one of the most uh, respectable newspapers in Chile, despite that it received funding from the CIA. That's been proven now beyond any doubt. They are able to put forward these arguments and point to Cuba, but not point to the fact that despite the fact that Cuba certainly has many problems, Cuba has been under a fierce U.S. embargo for 60 years. What they don't mention is that despite the fact that they have been to, and I've been to Cuba many times, I've traveled all over the island. What they don't mention is that despite the fact of the harsh economic sanctions, Cuba doesn't really have the, the slums, slums like in most parts of Latin America. Mm -hmm. uh, Cuba does not have a serious problem with crime and drugs. Cuba, despite its poverty and its enormous struggles, is actually a very healthy society. Cubans have access to sports programs, to health programs. Yes, the embargo is, is terrible. Yes, there's, there's scarcity of, of, of food, products, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the Cuban experiment, the United States and its allies has done absolutely everything to crush it. So when you look at Cuba on a superficial level, yes, parts of Havana are falling apart. That's true. There are potholes everywhere in Havana. But why? We need to always ask the why and look at the, the broader factors. So the Chilean right, is, is they've been successful in, in doing that. And also with Venezuela, once Chavez came onto the political scene, he was the new Fidel Castro, he was the new boogeyman. And then once the US sanctions were imposed on Venezuela and the political right started to do almost, the political right in Latin America always, they, there's almost like a manual that they follow in trying to overthrow progressive left-wing administrations. Horde products, go travel to Washington, ask for aid to be cut off, and then talk to members of the military to try and stage a coup d'etat. The same thing happened in Venezuela, and Venezuela has also run into problems. So there's a Venezuelan community now in Chile, and mainstream media will talk to them and just, again, highlight Venezuela's falling apart. Is this what, this is what Allende, this is what would have happened were Allende to have remained in power. What they don't mention is that the, almost immediately after the coup, the days, the, about a week after the coup, all the, the products were back on the shelves of the supermarkets. So they had been hoarded as the supporters of the Allende administration had been pointing out. I hope that through events and that have been held on the, the 50th anniversary, the world and particular younger generations in Chile will be educated and, and remember, be educated and remember as to the horrors that took place and the broader economic powers that were attempting to maintain the status quo in Chile and, and throughout Latin America and the world. And, and to look at the colossal human tragedy that the events of September 11 saw afterwards. I want to, like I said before, I want to thank you all for coming on today. One real quick thing, actually, is where could our audience, if, we'll put this in the show notes too, but if you also want to say where they could find out about your work, feel free to to share like anything like that right now. I'm on, I'm at Alborada, so you'll find me at Alborada at, in the UK indestructible podcast latin america with rodrigo acuña you'll also find me on my own website rodrigoacuña.com and i'm on twitter i'm on facebook Instagram. all of my social media is public all the stuff that i do the interviews the articles that i write in latin america they all go up on 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 the my social platform outlets for free i'm not available on social media and my, I don't have a webpage, even at the university, I've disabled it. I, I prefer to keep my own company, except for you wonderful gentlemen, of course. Yeah. Well, Listen to the Green and Red podcast for, for Clint. You can also, <laughs> Clinton's been in the news a lot in the last year or two, so you can just Google it. And there's all kinds of stuff about your role, especially in the, the documents. So you're easy to find. And folks can also check out Clinton's book, Sub Imperial Power. Australia in the international arena. I, I meant to actually intro this, put this in the initial intro. Sorry about that. Check it out. It's a great book.
Clinton has written many works on Australian foreign policy. I've read some of them and I highly recommend them. So just Google his name and, and, and look for his books. They are absolutely outstanding. He's a, you're a force of nature. You have a new book coming out every six months. So. <laughs> folks, folks out that's there. That's why I'm on social media. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't need to be. Is that a, a subtle uh, dig at me? <laughs> <laughs> I think you know what we talked about in Chicago, and uh, I really wish you would uh, you would achieve your 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 true potential and greatness, and and watch less baseball and actually do the work. <laughs> I'm studying Yankee imperialism, watching the Yankees, New York, Yankees. And, and eat eat less cannoli and more onions. Remember that? <laughs> I'm not giving up cannoli, man. Life's too short. <laughs> Folks, we've been talking with uh, Drs. Rodrigo Acuna and Quentin Fernandez talking about uh, Chile's 9-11, the Chilean coup at 50. Uh, if you like what you're hearing, please check us out on our social media, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. If you're listening to us on the many audio podcast platforms we're on, please uh, give us a rate and review. It helps us with the algorithms. And if you really like what we do, go to greenredpodcast.org and hit that support button and make a one-time donation or become a recurring donor at our patron, Patreon, patreon.com backslash greenredpodcast. It's been a great episode and really happy to talk to you all, talk to y'all, you both today and everyone else go out there and make trouble misbehave and we'll catch you again soon. Surely, Radio Macalanes will be silenced, and the quiet metal of my voice will no longer reach you. It does not matter. You will continue to hear me. I will always be with you. You should remember me as a man of dignity who was loyal to the nation. Workers of my country, I want to thank you for your unwavering loyalty, for the trust that you deposited in a man who was only an interpreter of great yearnings for justice, who gave his word that he would respect the Constitution and the law and did just that. At this definitive moment, the last moment when I can address you, I speak above all to the modest woman of our land, the Campesina who believed in us, to the woman laborer who worked more, to the mother who knew of our concern for children, I speak to the professionals of Chile, patriotic professionals who continued working against sedition promoted by the professional guilds, classist associations that defended the advantages for the few of a capitalist society. I speak to the youth, those who sang and gave us their joy and their spirit of struggle. I speak to the man of Chile, the worker, the farmer, the intellectual, those who will be persecuted. A social process will not disappear because a man disappears. It may be delayed. It may take longer, but in the end, it cannot be stopped. I want to tell you that you should have faith. History cannot be halted with repression or crime. This is a stage that will be overcome. This is a hard and difficult moment. It's possible that we will be vanquished, but tomorrow will belong to the people, to the workers. Humanity advances to conquer a better life. Other men will overcome this dark and bitter moment when treason seeks to prevail. You must continue to believe that much sooner rather than later, the grand avenues will again be opened through which free men will pass to build a better society. Long live Chile. Long live the people. Long live the workers. <laughs>